Because if you say the development of the first modernity of the sector, because people realise that you know, masses of people don't work well together. What, one of the things is that the Beatles stopped touring. In 1966, they did, did a big gig at Candlestick Park in San Francisco, and George Harrison got on the plane and he said, that's it, I'm not a Beatle anymore. And so eff effectively, George was the first person to leave the Beatles, although uh, they persuaded him otherwise, and of course he was with them for all the sessions and everything for the next few years. But the Beatles never did any more paid gigs. And they made some excuses for this, but I think they just didn't want to do it. They said that they couldn't recreate Sgt. Pepper, which came out in the Summer of Love. They said they couldn't reproduce that on stage. Well, was that true? Couldn't they have found a way to do it? How come sort of nearly every pub band can do Sgt. Yeah. Pepper now? Um, but they, did, they just didn't want to do it, I don't think. And so, th so they didn't. And they missed out on all the festivals. Even though they went along to the Isle of Wight Festival to hear Bob Dylan play, they didn't actually play themselves. And so it, it's strange, you have a whole pile of other bands coming in <coughs> who are perhaps more showbiz or, well, perhaps more showy than uh, the Beatles and uh, rock music changed in many, many ways. And a lot of things happened before the Summer of Love that sort of set the Summer of Love off. For example, psych um, for, well, I was talking to Gary Brooker, of, uh, uh, who did A Whiter Shade of Pale, lead singer on that. Um, I was talking to him and he was saying that A Whiter Shade of Pale was actually made in April 1967, and he said all the key records of the Summer of Love were made in the spring of love, and they're actually made before the summer of love, which, which is a, a, a good point. But even before that, you have psychedelia coming in before 1967. You have the Beatles doing Tomorrow Never Knows, which at the time was the track that nobody liked on the, the Revolver album, and now we see it as, as one of the key tracks. Just as in the same way, when Sgt. Pepper was re came out, the initial reviews say, why did they allow George Harrison to do five minutes, um, a five-minute Indian song on that, Within You, Without You? Whereas now, if you look at people writing about Sgt. Pepper today in books, that's regarded as one of the key tracks. So th things have changed uh, with hindsight. And, ninth, and you had Jimi Hendrix in 1966, he was making a big impression. So you had, as it were, spaced out trippy sounds coming in. You had Indian instruments coming in. Um, Dave Mason of Traffic was at the Philharmonic Hall only two nights ago. And he said, I can still play the guitar, but he said, I can't play the sitar anymore as I did on Paper Sun and Holding My Shoe because I can't get down there. <laughs> and so he, he didn't do them. And you have Simon and Garfunkel, they brought sitars into a track, uh, the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds and the like. And I've got here what I think is a very interesting quote from George Melly, who was a, a jazz singer really, but he was a great, um, he assessed the times very, very well. And this is what he says about Indian music. I'm bored very quickly by Indian music on account of what appears to be its monotony. I know that it isn't monotonous. I know that if I understood it, I would find it marvelous. The thing about drugs, is that they make everything less boring and more significant. <laughs> so that the Beatles were able to listen to Indian music for hours at a time without ever looking at their watches. <laughs> and it seeped into their own music. <clears throat> it went with the incense and the bells and the pots and the LSD and the catkins. All the 1960s images, which now seem extremely tiresome and dated. But in the case of the Beatles, their genius was strong enough to give continuous validity to their music. So that, that's uh, George Melly's take on Indian music there. Now, the Beatles, in my opinion, everyone who has written a Beatles book has got it wrong. The Beatles were great, but so were a lot of other bands. And I actually think that the Beatles book spent far too much time on that meme and the like. The thing that made the Beatles was the competition. The competition was so strong then they had to keep up with the Beach Boys, they had to keep up with the Rolling Stones, they had to keep up with the Kings. There were so many other bands that were doing really good stuff and it, it raised the level for the whole of them. 
Now you can take you, a good example of that is a few years ago in the 1990s, Oasis were the biggest group around. All they did was the same single over and over again. They wouldn't have got away with it in the 1960s. And what's more, their whole act was based on a Beatles B-side, Rain. I mean, when people say, um, I mean, if, if you say someone is Pinterest in, in terms of uh, plays, you mean they've got long silences in their plays. But if you say people are Beatley, what do you mean? Because the Beatles had so many different sounds. They try something like Rain, and then they move on to something else. I mean, Bob Dylan, for example, he gets an idea for a sound, like, say, National Skyline, and then he writes a whole theme of songs along that groove. So you've got a whole thematic album like that. And the Beatles didn't do that at all. Their albums are actually all over the place. Uh, Sgt. Pepper itself has got many, many different styles in it. And so when you say something's Beatley, you know, it, it's not quite sure what is actually meant by that. Whereas if you say something sounds like Oasis, there's only one sound it could possibly sound like. And to say that the Beatles, Oasis were like the Beatles is ridiculous, because Oasis never did an Alan Rupin. You can gather that I don't think much of Oasis, but then, there you are. Um, and there's, there's a book that came out, I mean, a lot of books on the Beatles, they regurgitate this, you know, there are N books on a subject where somebody writes the N plus ones book, and they regurgitate the facts that are in the previous one. But occasionally, interesting things come out, and I was looking, uh, well, the day before yesterday, actually, at Howard Soons's book on Paul McCartney. And he, uh, he describes Paul meeting Linda in 1967, and they go to the speakeasy, and it says, Paul heard Procol Harum singing A Whiter Shade of Pale for the first time. Now, that's great. So this is, he hadn't heard it on the radio. He heard Procol Harum doing it at this club. And the, the annoying thing about this book is that Howard Soons doesn't say what happens next. This is A Whiter Shade of Pale is possibly the great record from the Summer of Love. Paul McCartney hears it for the first time. What does he do? And the book doesn't tell us. And I would like to bet that he couldn't wait to get out of the speakeasy and dash back home to his keyboard or his guitar and, do, and say, I, we can't have this. We've got to do something to top it. And it's this feeling of competition that I think that made the 1960s so great. I mean, it was very bad for some people. I mean, Brian Wilson tried to keep up with the Beatles. And in the end, he actually couldn't do it and had a breakdown. But it just shows how hard people were actually trying. Now, in the early 60s, in, uh, Liverpool, Liverpool was the focus. In 1963, so much was happening in Liverpool. The music industry, as it were, was wrenched away from uh, being Liverpool, being London-based, and was very sort of Liverpool-centric for a time. And people even <coughs> brought uh, mobile recording studios here, and they recorded uh, a double album of Mersey Beat groups in the uh, Rialto Ballroom, for example. And so a lot was happening in Liverpool, but very soon uh, things went back to London again. And in 1966, 67, you had this image of swinging London. And you had the fashions in Carnaby Street and in King's Road. And you had people who were being very inventive with fashion, art, photography, and the like. I mean, that's an important thing about the Beatles uh, and the Stones too. Um, the Rolling Stones' first album uh, the cover of that was taken by David Bailey. Um, the Beatles had album covers by Angus McBean and Robert Freeman and the like. Um, Astrid Kirker took all those wonderful pictures of the Beatles when they weren't even known. You know, this is an unknown band and she's treating them as, as something sort of almost superhuman and getting these great pictures out of them. So a lot of things were happening uh, in lots of different artistic forms. And it all, as it were, comes together in rock. Um, I, c I can remember when I was at school, someone asked the careers master um, what you had to do to be a rock singer. And the careers master said, you don't even need O levels for that. <laughs> but he was completely wrong, because in fact, the greatest minds of the 1960s, I think, were actually working in rock. Now, you had all these fashions in Kings Road and Carnaby Street. And you had some boutiques in Liverpool. One of them, one of the most notable ones, was uh, through the Looking Glass, which was um, part of the Cavern Complex. 
uh, and I think it moved to I can say then, um, and that was run by John Gorman of the scaffold. <coughs> and so you had these very bright, I mean, if, if anything sums up 1967, I suppose, it's a kaleidoscope was the greatest invention of around that time because everything was bright colours, very garish. And this is a track from 1967, which is mocking 1967. Now, the interesting thing about this track, which is by the Bonzo Dog Band and is very short, is that Tony Blair heard it and took it seriously and used the phrase Cool Britannia um, as his, one of his logos in 1997. But here it is. This is how it was. Britannia, Britannia, you are cool. Take a trip, prisons ever, ever, ever shall be hip, 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 hip. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see, you can see, it was just written as a parody. The Bonzo Dogs were a joke band. Um, and it was just taken seriously 30 years later, and you have this phrase coming around of Cool Britannia, written by uh, Neil Innes. Now, there's quite a difference between what was happening in, in Britain and what was happening in America, and that big difference was Vietnam. And I think uh, one of the greatest things the British Prime Minister ever did was Harold Wilson, who said to President Johnson no to committing uh, British troops to Vietnam. So Britain didn't have that issue. Um, in America, lots of young people were being drafted and sent over to Vietnam. Most of them didn't even know where Vietnam was. They hadn't even been out of uh, the country. But a lot of people to avoid the draft, a uh, noted example would be the singer-songwriter Jesse Winchester, went off to Canada and uh, became Canadian citizens so they didn't get involved in the draft. So that was a huge issue at the time. And also in America, you had civil rights issues coming along as well. Um, speakers like Martin Luther King were making a very great impact. And people were realizing that uh, things had to, be, had to change in America. And although there were racial issues here, it was nothing like the same level as they were in America. And in America, you have this concept of the summer of love and also this phrase, flower park. And it all centers around San Francisco. And you've probably heard that famous record by Scott McKenzie, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. And uh, in, in fact, um, you, you probably heard Pete Frame, who does the Rock Family Trees. And uh, they were doing something on Radio 1 on the Summer of Love. They were making a documentary on the Summer of Love and Scott McKenzie was in the UK, and uh, he was trying, to, and they, they interviewed him at the BBC, and he was trying to get off with one of the researchers there, you see, and Pete Frame, when he did his tree on the Summer of Love, invented a group with this girl and Scott McKenzie in it, as a little joke, he always puts little mistakes in his family trees, and so this BBC researcher happens to be in this family tree for Pete Frame's Summer of Love, just as that joke. <coughs> but uh, Scott, Mc Scott McKenzie made if you, if you Go to San Francisco. And the British tried to cop copy that. Um, not too well, in a way, because uh, it's, it's, it's almost like that David Brent film, A Life on the Road, where Ricky Gervais writes very good rock songs, but they're always a little bit wrong, and something is wrong with them, and they don't actually work. And for example, uh, David Brent in the film tries to write a song like The Eagles going down the freeway at sort of uh, 80 miles an hour with, um, in an open top car with a girl by his side and everything. And of course, his song is a disaster. And it, but, it's, it, but you can see that it sort of sounds like an Eagles song, but he got it wrong. And, in, and you have that happening in England where a group like the Flower Pop Men, very competent songwriters, right, let's go to San Francisco without having been there. And it, it just sounds ridiculous compared to the Scott McKenzie song. 
Now, here's an American example anyway, which, which shows you, uh, this is Country Joe and the Fish, and this, sh this shows you the feeling about Vietnam there. <laughs> Give me a U! Give me a C! Give me a K! What's that spell? 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 Well, come on, all of you big strong men. Uncle Sam needs your help again. Got himself in a terrible jam Way down yonder in Vietnam Put down your books and pick up a gun We're gonna have a whole lot of fun And it's one, two, three What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn The next stop is Vietnam And it's five, six, seven Open up the pearly gates Well, there ain't no time to wonder why We're all gonna die now come on Wall Street, don't be slow I man, this is war a go-go There's plenty good money to be made Supply in the army, rules of the trade Just open it if they drop the bomb We're dropping on the Viet Cong And it's one, two, three What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn The next stop is Vietnam And it's five, six, seven Open up the pearly gates Well, I ain't no time Wonder why we're you all gonna die? Now come on, generals, let's move fast. Your big chance is here at last. Now you can go out and get those reds, cause the only good commie is one that's dead. And you know that peace can only be won when you're blowing them all the kingdom come. Sing it! One, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give them louder! People, I don't know how you expect to ever stop the war if you can't sing any better than that. There's about 300,000 of you fuckers out there. I want you to start singing. Come on. And it's one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. The next stop is Vietnam. And it's five, six, seven. Four. Boys on the Vietnam, come on, fathers, don't hesitate. The second son's off before it's too late. Be the first one on your block, now you're walking on the box. All right, one, two, three. What are we fighting for? Don't ask me, I don't give a damn. The next stop is Vietnam, and it's five, six, seven, four. Great film, somebody playing records, but still. <laughs> but um, yeah, very pitch, very skiffily, Jug Bandy sort of sounds, done as great fun, but the sort of record that wouldn't have been played on American radio at all, and the sort of start of the sort of underground radio stations and the like, and the underground groups. And in this country, well, Keith Seeger said when it was over, he said, uh, Vietnam was not a defeat for the American people. It was a defeat for the Pentagon. Now, there were a lot of poetry readings in Liverpool in the 1960s, and the person who organized most of them was a guy called, a librarian called Harold Hikins. And at every poetry reading that he ever gave, he read this poem. And this was about Vietnam, so he was trying to convey to the people of Liverpool what was happening over there. And it's called Lament for Three Young Men. I come from Texas, my skin is black. Came to Saigon, ain't going back. Got no taste now for that all American beans and ham since I gave my gullet to Vietnam. I come from Sydney, my skin is white. Didn't go much on conditions, but the pay was right. Now for pay and conditions, I don't give a damn since I gave my belly to Vietnam. I came from Saigon, I am pale brown. I marched as a conscript out of the town. No marching now, I stay where I am since I gave my legs to Vietnam. 
Now, if they could come back, that would be nice. But war, you know, costs a terrible price. And they all got us out of a terrible jam by all giving something to Vietnam. With the limbs and the organs of all those three, what a rich country that must be. So that's Harold Hikins' poem. He read it every time he appeared. Uh, it has a power about it, doesn't it? Uh, ex 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've never read it al aloud before, and it, it is, you, as you say it, you can feel it's a very emotional poem, that, and uh, re really very good. Uh, British psychedelia, though, doesn't have this Vietnam element about it. Uh, I mean, if you listen to George Harrison's All Together Now, there's a line in that that says, Can I take you home for tea? And that's more the sort of British type of psychedelia, really. And you've got that great love of Kitsch, Kitsch on that marvellous cover for Sergeant Pepper, which uh, Peter Blake did, um, which is about, well, I suppose Peter, the Dark Side of the Moon is the most covered, copied cover of all time, but Sergeant Pepper is one that is covered again and again and again. And Peter Blake does new versions of it as well. It is extraordinary. Um, now the Beatles made, there was a lot of controversy over some of the Beatles records. Um, they banned A Day in the Life, the BBC banned A Day in the Life uh, for drugs references. And here's John Lennon in the Daily Mirror talking about it. Um, how anybody could read drugs into A Day in the Life, I don't know. They're trying to read drugs into everything these days. <laughs> John Lennon lying through his teeth there. <laughs> a couple of months later, the Beatles uh, do I Am, I Am the Walrus at the end of 1967 on the Magical Mystery Tour. Here's, uh, this is actually uh, an internal email from the BBC, uh, which comes from the head of Light Entertainment, and it says, the lyrics of I Am the Walrus contain a very offensive passage. Presumably that's a bit about taking your knickers down. And after talking to Anna Instone, we have both agreed not to play it on radio or television. Although not officially banned, it will not be heard on Top of the Pops or Jukebox Jury. I should be grateful if you would ensure that all possible outlets are blocked off. But it's not officially banned, so <laughs> I'm not sure what the difference is there. But I, I presume they didn't want it in the papers as, as down as a ban. But they, they were making sure people didn't hear it on the radio. I mean, I remember in 19... Well, in, in fact, at the B, I've had both John Savage and Mark Lewison on my show on BBC Radio Merseyside telling me that although I've listened to Sergeant Revolver and Sergeant Pepper over the years, because I've never taken drugs, I've never actually heard those albums properly. <laughs> so that's, that's on my bucket list for when I die. <laughs> my wife to go out and... Um, underneath the railway bridge and get something and I'll listen to Revolver and Sergeant Pepper and hear, hear what I'm actually missing. Um, in 1967, I remember going to the Blue Coat Arts Centre to see a film starring Peter Fonda called The Trip, which was all about taking drugs. And that was a real kaleidoscopic film there. It was, it was very difficult to watch for 90 minutes. It, it really was like watching a kaleidoscope for 90 minutes, but it did give, that film, um, and I presume parts of it will be on YouTube, gives you a real feeling of 1967 and what that period was, was like. You find, in fact, that the Beatles had sort of moved away from the Liverpool bands at that time. The other Liverpool bands who had all the hit singles like The Searchers and Jerry and the Pacemakers, these were people who liked to drink after they did their gigs. They weren't interested in the drugs at all. And so the Beatles were having a new lot of friends and acquaintances around these London clubs like the Speakeasy and Scotts and St James and the like. And it was certainly affecting their songwriting. I mean, one of the reasons people, well, one of the reasons people didn't say they took drugs <coughs> was because uh, they could be arrested for it if they, if they said they did. But another one is that no songwriter ever wants to say, taking drugs influenced my songwriting because it looks like you're not being terribly creative. You're just sort of seeing pink elephants as you take LSD and then writing a song about it. So that people like to say, no, no, it, it's all my invention, these songs. But Bob Wooler, who was a DJ at the Cavern, uh, was, asked in 19, was asked about 1967 by the Melody Maker. 
and uh, they said to him, uh, Bob, what happened to Liverpool during the year of flower power? And he said brilliantly, that was the year Liverpool went to sea. <laughs> <coughs> so there was this blaze of colour around the country. It wasn't so much that in Liverpool. In fact, if, if you see that film about John Lennon's childhood, No Word Boy, uh, it starts off with John Lennon, the young John Lennon in St George's Hall, going in and out, running in and out of the pillars. And it was shot today, so the pillars were all beautifully clean and looking great. In 1967, that was all jet black. They were only just starting to clean film, to clean the, the buildings then. And Liverpool was a, was a dirty looking city, as were a lot of the other cities. And that changed in a few years. Um, I remember there was a, quite a lot happening on, uh, at the Everyman, for example. I, I remember going to an evening that was billed as the Summer of Love evening. And I thought, this is going to be great, love and things all, all on the stage, and like, what's going to happen here? And it was an extraordinary event because it started off with a singer-songwriter called Mike Hart coming on uh, in a Chinese army outfit and reciting or screaming out the contents of the little red book to rock music. And that was the first 10 minutes of a summer of love event. So I mean, it had nothing to do with the summer of love, but it just shows how people sort of sabotage events and things. And the only pop festival I can remember in Liverpool that I went to was at Fulby Hall, which was a one-day pop festival featuring the scaffold, and that was about it. <laughs> but there is some Liverpool psychedelia, and here's a, an example of that. This is a, a singer called Jimmy Campbell, who uh, had a group called the Kirby's, and then to become sort of more hippie in 1967, called the group the 23rd Turn Off, uh, a reference to uh, the M59 there. And this, if we can get the numbers going, this is a song called Michelangelo, which came out in 1967. It didn't sell, but it, it's a lovely example. Books it referred to as the Great Liverpool Experiment. 
again, this is some of inventing a term with hindsight, the Great Liverpool Experiment. Nobody ever thought that at the time. People just thought we'll get up and read a few poems. Um, poetry was regarded as part of academia sort of in the early 60s. But it changed because people decided that they would write songs about what was happening around them. They would write funny poems. They would write songs that were pertinent to the news of the day. And you had three very great talents in Liverpool, Roger McGough, Brown Patton, and Adrian Henry, who was also a painter. And they organized poetry readings really around this area and then around Merseyside as a whole. And then you have Harold Hikins, whose poem I read. He was organizing a lot of events. And he actually organized two big poetry readings at the film, which were called Big Poetry Nights. And this was really to try and top the big poetry reading that had been at the Royal Albert Hall with Allen Ginsberg in 1965. And Ginsberg came to Liverpool and uh, he made the quote that says, Liverpool is at present the centre of the <coughs> conscious... Liverpool is at the present moment the centre of the consciousness of the human universe. Um, he actually said that about Budapest as well. He said it about a few other places. Anyway, he went really. But, but he said it in Liverpool. Um, he said it, I think, in uh, St John's Gardens. Um, a famous quote that's been printed all over the place. And this phrase, the Liverpool scene, came around to describe all these poetry, all this activity that was really around Liverpool 8 with the poets and the painters. In fact, there was a famous fight in Liverpool 8 between the poets and the painters. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one Liverpool, Liverpool <coughs> painter called Maurice Cockrell, um, who, whose wife walked out on him, and he put all his paintings in the middle of a road in Liverpool 8 and set fire to them. And the extraordinary thing is that years later, when I interviewed him, he was the keeper of the paintings at the Royal Academy. <laughs> Crazy job to give someone like that. Anyway, this was the book, The Liverpool Scene, which is edited by Edward Lucy Smith. This, had, uh, this was launched at the cavern, and they invited everybody to it. And they all brought along their partners, and there was so much drink around that nearly everybody went home with a different partner. It wrecked a whole pile of relationships. And it's, it's got photographs in it. There's Pete Brown. He um, was the lyricist for Cream as well. He was from London, but he came up to Liverpool a lot. He did an awful lot for poetry readings in this area, as well as, as, well as in London. And he used to stay with it. In fact, he, he used to stay with Adrian Henry, and he once went back with a girl to Adrian's flat, and he had to go, get, get, get a train early in the morning. And this girl was zonked out on drugs. And on her back, he wrote in a flow master, Adrian, gone to London, Peter. And Adrian woke up in the morning and saw this on this girl's back, so he knew where Pete Brown had been. So these were extraordinary people, really, um, really living on the edge. And even though it contains some of the same poems, Adrian Henry, Roger McGough, and Brown Patton were also featured in a volume of Penguin Modern Poets here. This is Penguin Modern Poets number 10. The first nine volumes had just been sort of academic volumes that had sold a few thousand and the like. This sold 100,000 copies when it came out in 1967. Extraordinary. No well, John Lennon's poetry book um, in, his own, in his own right and then a Spaniard in the works uh, sold sort of hundreds of thousands, of course. Um, but this sold 100,000 copies, which is quite extraordinary and led to a whole pile of readings and a career for all three of them in, uh, in poetry, and people around the country were starting to write poems then. And Roger McGough uh, is a Catholic, and he wrote a poem, he was commissioned to write a poem for the opening of the Catholic cathedral. And here's a little bit of it. He said, let it not be a showroom for would-be good Catholics, or worse, a museum, a shrine, a concrete hearse, but let it be a place where lovers meet after work for kind words and kisses, where dockers go on a Saturday night to get away from the missus. <laughs> after visiting you, may traffic wardens let nosy parkers off, noisy parkers off, and policemen dance on the beat. Barrow men knock a shilling off ecstasiates sing in the street. That's hard to read this, actually, yeah. And let the cathedral laugh even show its teeth. And it must wear the cassock of dignity, 
and then glimpse the jeans beneath. O oh Lord, on thy new Liverpool address, let no bombs fall. Keep always a light in the window, a welcome mat in the hall, that it may be a home sweet home from home for all. And Adrian Henry, um, being this kind of Renaissance man, wanted to be a rock singer too, and he formed the group Liverpool Scene. And they put out an album called The Amazing Adventures of Liverpool Scene, the whole band is on there. There's Adrian Henry, there's Mike Evans, there's Mike Hart, Mike Evans' his wife. In fact, I've always thought you could do a very, very good article around all the people that are on here. I mean, even the local drug dealer is on here. And uh, there's O'Connor's Tavern, that's the guy who ran, ran the... It's at O'Connor's Tavern, and there's the guy who ran O'Connor's Tavern, there's the drummer, Brown Dodson, so, and the fashions and everything. It's, it's a wonderful picture of Liverpool in 1967. But even better, on the inside here, at the Catholic Cathedral, there you see the Liverpool scene, the five members of Liverpool scene. And so it's a very good, very good picture of that. You, you, in fact, a, a, a current fan could be taken in exactly the same pose today. What? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. No, this is, this is at the Albert Dock. <laughs> there, there is a photo of the Liverpool scene at, at, the, at, the, at the cathedral, and I always thought it was on the back of this album, but I, I should have checked that. But it, it, anyway, it, it, it gives you an idea of... Uh, they, they were, like, like the Beatles, they were very, very keen on promoting that they came from Liverpool. Before, in the past, um, I mean, Hull is a city of culture this year, David Whitfield came from Hull, one of the big singers of the 1950s. I bet nobody knew that at the time. Though. People, people didn't, you know, they didn't sort of talk about their backgrounds, but the Beatles did, and it was something to come from uh, Liverpool. And also, uh, at Scaffold as well, uh, Roger McGough was in Scaffold with John Gorman and Mike McGear, Paul McCartney's brother, and they did comedy shows as well. They used to do regular shows at the Everyman. They'd be on for about three weeks at a time. They did a show called PC Pod in 1967, and that ended with the whole audience singing All You Need Is Plod to the tune of All You Need Is Love. And also in 1967, Yoko Ono came to Liverpool and took part in a happening at the Blue Coat Art Centre. And on the current leaflet for the blue coat, for what's on at the moment, there's a picture of Yoko Ono sweeping the floor. I mean, you may be amazed that I paid good money to see Yoko Ono oh, sweeping, the, sweeping the floor and eating a ham sandwich and even climbing a stepladder. But that's what happened in Happenings then. It was really to gauge, I think, she was trying to gauge the audience reaction. And I well remember at the end of the evening um, when Yoko Ono was covered in bandages and John Gorman was in the audience and he shouted out to her, you're wanted on the phone. <laughs> but my most endearing mem memory of 1967 is indeed going up on stage uh, and, and Adrian Henry was on stage too and we were both bandaging Yoko Ono. And you, you, Adrian was bandaging her top and I was modestly bandaging her feet uh, but I'm very proud of this because uh, I actually touched Yoko Ono before John Lennon did. <laughs> okay? Uh, so what we'll, what we'll do now is I'll, I'll invite uh, Mike Brocken and Ron Ellis. And we'll just have a discussion. Thank you. So... We'll kick off with mine because we've made a few notes. Probably, oh, yes, probably I'm disagreeing. I know he's just doodling, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> disagreeing with all I said. Oh, no, no, I, I mean, I think it is important that we, uh, we acknowledge two or three things that Spencer said. Um, if you go into research this sort of stuff, I, th I always think that it's a very good idea to kind of uh, make sure that we don't start our research up in the wrong place. And I would feel that... Um, if you start off with the kind of proposition that there was a summer of love, you're making a mistake. The, especially with Liverpool. Because it's not that it wasn't coined at the time, and it's not that it's, it's not become a kind of a lingua franca of 1967, and all that kind of thing. But I just think that we need to recognise um, 
that it, it, the summer of love was a cliche. It was a cliche that it was mediated by you know the print media and uh, the radio and television media at the time. It described certain aspects of, particularly in America, as Spencer points out, the counterculture. The counterculture is a very prominent feature of all of this, which actually, you know, it, it could be historically suggested that the counterculture did contribute to, to America uh, stopping the war in Vietnam. You know, it did have a contributory factor to it. So the idea that there was a summer of love should actually, as researchers, uh, be something that you question, I would say. Don't just take it as a de facto idea. You should kind of appreciate that this is something that's up for grabs. Particularly as a, as a young teenager growing up in Liverpool, I can tell you. Um, because Liverpool, for me, growing up in it, was a very conservative city musically. Um, anything that was a little bit weird. I mean, all of the stuff that Spencer was talking about, and I remember as a kid wanting to go to some of this stuff. My colleagues at school had absolutely no interest in this stuff whatsoever. They thought there was a complete weirdo and they were listening to Motown, you know. And Motown, we're talking about lingua franca, that, that for me was the lingua franca of growing up in Liverpool. And I, I regarded at the time as so being rather conservative, I must be honest, I thought that was a very conservative thing. So I think that you, you know, if you're going out looking for it, you, you've got to be careful in a way that you might find it. Now that's, you might think, oh, that's a good thing. It's actually not really. The idea should be that your, we call it a priori ideas, don't interfere with your research. The research needs to speak for itself. So if you have this a priori idea that you're going out to find it, you will find it. And it, a priori just means, you know, you've already made your mind up that it's there. And that's something that you would need to be very careful of, I would say, in, in your research. Um, also, the idea of, of, um, of uh, the summer of love is, is also kind of a function myth, I would say. You're talking about Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump, you know, to me, as an observer of American culture for many, many years, is a classic example of the American function myth. Really, you know, you know, uh, we, we all get the politicians we deserve. You know, to be honest, um, and America have just received a politician that f uh, fulfills their function myth. And I think that you know, the idea of thinking about the way the function myth works across popular music and popular culture is an interesting one. Certain phrases, certain stock phrases start to appear and they become you know, the, the sort of uh, accepted language of, of that particular era. When for many people in Liverpool at the time, even my schoolmates is the same, but certainly many people, you know, the stuff at the Blue Coast and this Hope Hall and uh, you know, what was going on in Liverpool age, that passed most Liverpool feeds by completely. So you'd have to make sure that you don't overemphasize the function myth side of it as well. And then the third thing I'd just like to comment, comment on is, is, you know, as a historian, is that um, one of the most flawed aspects of historical investigation is oral history. It's always one of the most interesting. Uh, but as Spencer kind of pointed out, really, it's completely flawed. Because there are all sorts of, of and it, but it's good, you know, it's really interesting, so do it. But you should all, always remember that certain things stand in the way of it being like a, a truthfulness or a fact of the past. You know, people are remembering from a distance of half a century now. Uh, not only is that distance, you know, a long time to remember what you were like when you were a kid, but very often people in oral history, and Spencer will tell you all about this if we had time, about, you know, marginal characters placing themselves at the centre of activities in popular music happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Also, you find that memory is affected by what happens in between that time. With music, that's a big thing, isn't it? Because you might find that, you know, you fell in love to your wife in 1967 to the 23rd turn-off, but you split up in 1985, so you cannot stand the 23rd term. You know, all of these other things intervene in that period of time as well. So when you do go out and talk to people or interview people, you do have to be very careful that you understand that this is a complete setup. The way that you're even interviewing people, somebody is artificial, isn't it? It's a completely artificial process. So notwithstanding all of that, um, that's where your research can actually, you know, there's not so much you can do about it. Human agency is human agency. But we need to take account of that. We need to take account of, you know, function myth, our a priori ideas, and also the idea that we're working in an area of oral history, which is probably one of the most flawed areas. And what you've got to do with oral history is try to cross-reference it with data.
That's the key issue, really. So if you're looking for something about those exciting things that were going on in Hope Hall and things that I always wanted to go to, poetry, I was very fascinated by all that. I was too young, you know. Um, you'd have to look at the Echo, wouldn't you? You'd have to look at the Liverpool Weekly News. You'd have to try and find out data about this as well. So I would say that. But a, a lot of that wouldn't be in the Echo. Well, no, it wouldn't. And, but the, you, you might even find that there are pamphlets over in the Central Library that, that they've stored away, that there are this, this kind of stuff to do with the folk scene is very interesting in Liverpool. Liverpool's folk scene was second only to that of London by 1967. And that there was, there was literature with it, you know, there would be flyers, etc. you know, would go along, and very often the stuff that was linked to Adrian Henry uh, was also linked, you know, to the folk scene, and Stan Ambrose was involved in all of that, you know, my predecessor of Adrian Med's side as well. So you've got a lot of kind of cross-referencing to do there. So, so for me, the idea of the Summer of Love is, is as much to do with the, the counterculture in Liverpool, so a minority of people, are, an extraordinary minority of people, while Liverpool went about its daily life, as it had done for the previous God knows how many years. You've got this stuff going on, folk scenes, blue coat activities, um, Hope Hall, yeah, every man, etc. Folk clubs abounding all over Liverpool as well. Um, that's not seeing singing sea shanties isn't exactly you know the 23rd turn off, but it's still kind of regarded as a very very interesting aspect of a, of what might appear to some to be a counterculture in Liverpool and the roots of which go right back into the late 1940s, in actual fact, with the trad jazz scene, you know, the Mississippi jazz band go back that early. So there are always going to be kind of minorities in cities like Liverpool that like to see life in a, in a, in a different way. And there, I would say, the aspects of the counterculture that end up being stereotyped by 67 as, you know, something to do with the summer of love. But in actual fact, it's more to do with Liverpool 8, you know, and Bentley Road, and you know all of those sort of areas where you know where the flats were very cheap. Having lived in Bentley Road myself, so 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 you've got issues to do with cultural geography in Liverpool, which is interesting. The Liverpool Lakes, very interesting. You think about, you know, the, the, the two cathedrals are on the the borderline of that, aren't you? You know, clubs clubs like the Sink would be a very very interesting area to look at. I remember going to the Sink as a very young boy and finding it was the first club I'd ever seen that had black and white people in. I'd never seen that before. Never seen it before, and that's it. The same. So, so those kind of aspects, I think, I, you know, I, I completely agree with Spen that there's some very interesting areas. But make sure that you don't think that every Liverpoolian in this city was involved in kind of countercultural activity. They most certainly were not. Yeah. And it, we were, and I say we, the royal we, really, in a way. But I, I, I said we were regarded as weirdos, you know. We I'll, were. I'll, yeah. co I'll come to Ron in a second. Yeah, but. One point about the Mersey poets is that they do seem to have had a sense of their own importance because they didn't throw anything away. Yeah. And if you go to Liverpool University now, you can see it online at the Sydney Jones University. They have given their papers, that's Adrian Henry, Roger McGough, Brown Patton, they've given their papers to the university, which have all been documented, going right back to their childhood. They've got you, there's so much there. And so you could pick out things from 1967, you could look at Roger McGough's diary or Adrian Henry's diary, you can see letters that they wrote. So there's an awful lot of actuality yes, that you can is. actually see yeah, there, absolutely. and uh, you, you just get lost in it. I, yeah, I just love spending the day there. I mean, to, just, uh, sorry to say, Spencer, just mm -hmm. talking about actuality, I just made a couple of notes before it came out this morning, actually. Another area of 67, talking about actuality, listen to this, 1967, legislation. The Abortion Act, the Sexual Offences Act, changes to the BBC, which was brought about from 63 through to 67. 67 is when Radio 1 and local radio starts. Misrepresentation at Work Act, the Discrimination Employment Act, and the Family Planning Act, all 1967. <laughs> All 1967. So it is an interesting year, but it, the, those acts were passed as a culmination of things that preceded it, didn't they? So we've got years of debate before 67, but it shows you that, that you know, 67 is an interesting year historically. It is a key, a key year with key individuals, as we were talking about before. Also, Spencer was talking about studio sound as well, really. You know, technology, very important. You know, studio sound technology changes the way that records sound. Records in 1967 couldn't have been made in 1963. It would have sounded completely different. That's a key 
progress, isn't it? You know, uh, even though the Beatles are recording on four tracks, aren't they? But you know, what is it that Ringo said? They had a, they had a sixty, an eight track or a sixteen track, but they didn't have a plug. He said about Abbey Road, something like that. Anyway, so so those are, those are key issues. So you know, the, you know, this cathedral being built in nineteen sixty seven was a developmental process of not only you know the Catholic Church actually you know putting a modernist building up, but it's also about Catholicism in Liverpool and the recognition, actually, of Catholicism from uh, the dark days of the early 19th century. You know, the Oxford movement at the turn of that century is a very, very important thing. The Oxford movement kind of leads to the development of this cathedral. I remember there was, the, you know, the crypt is part of an earlier project in 1930, was it? So, so this stuff needs to be taken in context all of the time, and I think Spencer did very well there to kind of present you with a contextual involvement in what's around, you know. Um, and a lot of the stuff that affects popular music, I think, um, is actually got nothing or little to do with popular music. You find that other things affect the situation musically. Now, in 1967, Ron Ellis was a librarian, and he was also putting on gigs. He was yeah. a promoter in Liverpool and things. Your memories? Well, my memories in 1967, I was disc jockeying in Liverpool, and I was also putting groups out. I was managing groups. But um, I come from Southport, and to live at uh, people in Southport, Liverpool was a dirty, grimy city full of bomb sites. People are selling cars on bomb sites. Buildings were black. It was all the soot from the coal. And I'd never really come to Liverpool very much, except occasionally we'd get a tram down to the docks and a ferry over to Birkenhead. And when I started running groups, it was around about 1963. 62 or 63, and uh, I was a librarian and I came to Liverpool doing a day for once a day weekly course on librarianship, and eventually it ended up as a two year course at the, uh, the university, which was a college of commerce in those days. And uh, I, there was a group in Southport that I went to take photographs of them, and they asked me if. Uh, did I want to have a go at singing? And I said, yes, I'd like to sing. But unfortunately, when they heard me sing, they said, no, you can't sing, but you've got a suit and a big mouth. You can be our manager. <laughs> so what does that entail? They said, well, you just go around pubs and clubs and you just ask them if they want a group. So I had some business cards printed and I got the train into Liverpool because I had no car. And I just walked around the streets of Liverpool. And we're talking about 1964 now. And the streets of Liverpool were full of, um, as uh, Mike says, Tamla Motown, soul music. There was nothing like this in those days. And by the time 1967 came, and all this sort of summer of love music, psychedelic music came out, which basically came from London here, mm -hmm. and they copied it in Liverpool. But most of the groups were playing the pop stuff, and they were playing the big soul music things. And you could tell this by the sort of the clubs you went into. Another thing you also noticed was a club called the Black Cat Club. And there was a peppermint lounge in Fraser Street. And the peppermint lounge had the pop groups on. Upstairs in the Black Cat, you had country groups, country and western. And in Liverpool, there was a whole big country and western scene that was totally different from anything else that you'd call flower power or anything like this. It was probably working class music, just like it was in America. But um, the crowd of people that went there wouldn't be seen dead anywhere near Hope Hall mm -hmm. or places like that. The Sink Club in Hope Street where they had the rumbling tongue and the Sink, I used to put groups on there. The groups that played there would never be playing mostly in places like the Cavern and the Iron Door. They'd be playing in places like the Hope Hall, which later became the Everyman Theatre. And the groups like um, Roger McGough and the poetry groups they do pop music like Lady of the Pink, but in no way could you ever think of them as groups in the same way as you think of the people playing in the other clubs like the Searchers and the Beatles, etc. And when the Beatles first started out, and they were just playing locally, um, I used to get records from, the, from America. And I used to um, have somebody, do you remember when you had pen friends in those days? You wrote up to America and somebody would be your pen friend and you'd write back to them. And I got a pen friend called Ronnie Kellerman. And amazingly, he was a friend of Jerry Lee Lewis, which I thought was amazing. And um, he sent me catalogues of records, and I could order them 
and he'd send them to me, and I'd tape them and then sell them, because I hadn't much money, I couldn't afford to buy them, so I sold them. And uh, I sold them to the groups, and I sold them to the Beatles. And the records they bought were all the American soul records, people like James Brown and the Olympics. They bought records of people who had hits in Britain, but they didn't bring the LPs over here, so they could buy the albums and get songs from the albums that wouldn't be released in Britain. And that was a whole scene come up to 1967, mm. by which time I'd been about three years as an agent and manager. And, um, and as Mike said before, you didn't see many black groups in Liverpool. But I used to go to the Nigeria Club in Upper Parliament Street. Brilliant club. Um, nowadays, well, not perhaps now, but in the 80s, you'd have been frightened to go anywhere in that area because by then all the drugs and things were on the scene and that was when we had the riots. In 67, that was an artistic area, but you didn't get black groups playing in the, all the clubs in Liverpool like you do now. And um, one of the groups I used to book was the Olympics, who lived around Granby Street area, and they played at the Nigeria. So you had all these different clubs in Liverpool, different scenes, and you didn't really get a sense of a summer and love being a movement. What you did have in America, you knew about Vietnam, you knew about the poor there, the flower power, records like San Francisco, the Mammoths and Poppers. I had a group called the Patton People who played all Mammoths and Poppers records. And they used to play the clubs. I think the idea was that if you joined a group, you had a few hits and then you went into cabaret. And so you get people like Jerry and the Pacemakers. I don't know if you saw a programme last night on television called The Science of Pop, in which they said the people who really were influential in the 60s were people like the Kinks and the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds because they were loud and the music crashed out whereupon the Beatles played nice happy little songs which were almost like nursery rhyme songs and later the Beatles could see themselves going into cabaret. It was when they went down to London and mixed with all the people who had started to do the psychedelic stuff, Jimi Hendrix and that, that they changed their ideas. Until then and possibly if they'd have stayed in Liverpool, they'd have owned like a lot of Liverpool groups. They'd be Freddie and the Dreamers from Manchester, people like that. They went into sort of middle of the road music, played mecca ballrooms. So it was quite a separate thing. And people always talk about the 60s as being the 60s, but the 60s really didn't start till about 1964, 65. It was only when all these other social things came along, like the pill and everything, um, where there was a sense of release from people. They weren't living like they had in the wartime years, all the singers, if you look at the hit parade in 1967, for example, you see people like Frank Sinatra, David Whitfield, Marion Ryan having record hits. Um, there was only a few creeping in that were people like traffic and things that were could be called psychedelic and flower power. And it wasn't really till the early 70s when the whole psychedelic movement became such a big thing that we look back on it now and say, oh yeah, that dates back to the summer of love 60s, because that happened to be a good focal point to start it. But there was so much else going on at the time that you really didn't notice it. It was just that odd records cropped up. But as time went on, there was more of them, more of the groups went into that psychedelic stuff. And then so you get, um, by the time in the mid 70s come, you get in the Grateful Dead and all the groups like this. So it was quite a different period. There was one now. <coughs> I, I did some. I, I've always been interested in psychedelia. It's one of my sort of areas of interest, and I've, I've spent a few different research trips in San Francisco <coughs> over the years. And uh, the first time I went over there was in the late. It's actually it was bicentennial year in America. It's 1976. <coughs> seems a long time ago now, just, but I, I managed to interview just from a personal point of view. Some of my uh, got in touch with a couple of my heroes. Really, I, I was always a big typical Scouser. You know, we like West Coast music and. Um, I was a big fan of bands like Love and Jefferson Airplane, but my major, my major band was a group called Quicksilver Messenger Service, you've probably never heard of them, but they were from San Francisco. And I managed to, to talk to one of the guys, <coughs> and we were talking about this Summer of Love stuff, and he, he just started laughing, you know, uh, uh, and a guy called Gary Duncan, and Gary said, listen, by the time the press picked up on this in 1967 in Hyde-Ashbury, it was finished. The mo and he said, you know, the moment the press find out about something, it's all over, as far as the counterculture is concerned. 
And I, that's always stuck with me. Now, you may or may not agree with that comment, but it's always stuck with me because I thought, that's an interesting one. Uh, uh, coming from the point of view that Spencer was coming up before, that you know, it was building up a certain amount of pace before that year, wasn't it? And you know, some of these guys were folkies. You know, Dylan influenced them. Some of them had been involved in rock and roll groups. Some of them were in surf groups all, you know, across the West Coast of America. And by the time the press starts to coin the word Summer of Love, and lots of people are appearing on the streets of Height and Ashbury Street. It's just a, two streets in, in San Francisco. Um, according to Gary, he said, it was finished then, because the whole scene had kind of exploded and the media had picked mm -hmm. up on it. And it reminded me very much of this Summer of Love about, you know, if you're looking into the word Beatlemania, it's a very interesting research topic, isn't it? Because you find that it is a, it's a cliche like the Summer of Love, but if you look at it, kind of in the right direction, you start to realise that it's a creation, particularly from the back three months of 1963, you know, around about the time of uh, the Beatles being on Sunday night at the London Palladium and the Royal Variety Show, all that October into November period of the 63, the Daily Mirror's very heavily involved in all of this, the writers of the Daily Mirror, Don Short and Donald Zeck, they're heavily involved in it, and they knew Brian Epstein very well, you'll see, you might see pictures from the, uh, of the Beatles from 63, and, uh, you know, of holding copies of the Daily Mirror. You know, so all of that kind of thing, it's, it's very interesting to follow the descriptive narrative, not just kind of take it for granted that it exists, you know. And I always thought that was very interesting, picking up on both of those points. And I, I was talking about the competitiveness of the Beatles yeah, and everybody yeah. else. And I can actually remember in the 1960s that when the, I didn't automatically buy, even though I loved them, a Beatles record or a Bob Dylan record automatically because there was so much other good stuff around. Yeah. They weren't sort of streets ahead of everybody else. Is, is that your impression too? Uh, it, it certainly is, yes. Although I'm a big Beatles fan, always was, loved them as a kid. Um, but I tended to think that the Beatles were good kind of magpies. That they picked up on stuff and, and re-articulated. And that's what popular music's all about, you know. Nobody invents anything in popular music. It's beggars and thieves most of the time. But when you pick something that you're influenced by, you, it goes through your brain and you turn it into something that you're interested in. Uh, and so, for me, the Beatles were always re really strong. Um, they must have been good listeners. And uh, I think that they were pretty good record collectors as well. They'd buy stuff. Do you, know, do you ever remember, you know, the periods of time when Elton John sold off his record collection to, you know, to, for charity, hasn't it? As well as his, as his clothes and all sorts of things. And I've, I've always thought, I'd love to meet Elton John because I bet he was a great record collector. And I've always, you know, as a kid, we didn't have any money anyway. So, you know, I, I was a radio person. But, you know, once I was able to afford to buy records, I started to buy records. And I thought that the Beatles were uh, record collectors. And I like, you know, what, what Ron was saying about the fact that they wanted, they devoured m other music. And I think that's a, a real feature of that period of time. You know? It was strange the things they bought, though. Because most of them were black American soul music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were the ones who wanted yeah. stuff you couldn't get in England. Yeah, yeah. Um, if somebody had a hit in America, they'd want to know what else had they done. Yeah. But the, the record companies never put that out. They put one follow up, never put the album out. So they're not just producers of sound, are they? They're listeners to sound as well, like all of us. And it stops us thinking about them as being kind of, uh, you know, I've never been very keen on this auteur theory stuff, you know? You know, genius and all the rest of it. I'm not keen on it. I think we like auteurs, don't we? We like authorship of stuff. And that's very much a classical music orientation, I find. You know, the, you know, the, the, the easy way to explain you know, uh, Beethoven, say, is to suggest that Beethoven was a genius. Then everybody goes, oh, all right then. But actually, you know, you could argue that, that, that Beethoven, Beethoven picked up loads and loads of folk music from Germany, didn't he? And re-articulated it all the time. And I think if you thought about it in those terms, in terms of popular music, it's very much easier to understand that they're listeners as well as producers. But also, it kind of, it doesn't reduce them in your admiration. Actually, for me, it heightened them in my admiration because it meant that they, I could, we could have been Beatles. Yes, yeah. But is, is one of the problems, or one of the reasons for the friction in the Beatles, the fact that they had two geniuses, possibly even three in the same group, well, I don't, I so don't, there was a lot of conflict? No. <laughs> but, but you know, it's a matter of opinion, Sven, isn't yeah. it? I don't, I, don't, I don't go for the word genius. Right. You know, I, don't, I don't go for it. I think there are so many, you know, what you were talking about laying the groundwork out there is a good way of showing that, that things fall together just as much as things fall apart, I would say. And sometimes key moments in time can be as a result 
of a lot of different conjunctures being drawn together at the same time. If you think of Sergeant Pepper, this is the Beatles stepping, they're fed up with being Beatles, aren't they? They want to do something different. But at the same time, you know, they can block book Abbey Road because they've, they've earned EMI loads and loads of money. They've got a producer who's used to working with string quartets, actually. That's why we trained as a musician. And then you've got, as we mentioned before, the technology. They can fiddle around as much as they like with these amazing stew the tape recorders and do backwards running loops. This stuff, you know, that you'd have to have a man in a white suit or a brown or, or a, a white coat or a, a, a brown coat intervening in 1963. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. I mean, maybe even in 67. But certainly, the technology falls into place at that time as well. So, as you said before, you couldn't have made Sergeant Pepper in 1963. It just wasn't physically possible. And then, you know, Dark Side of the Moon, I think you mentioned as well, later on in the 70s. That's almost a digital record, you know. It's not quite digital technology at that stage. That's the furthest you could push analog recording at that stage. It's very high tech, incredibly high tech. And it's, it's fascinating when you look at the anthology, and there's so many outtakes from Pepper, isn't it? You know, it's like take one, slice, splice with take 95, or something like that. You know, it's not real, it's an artifice. And that's the great thing well, about they, it. They did 102 takes and not guilty and didn't even put I it out. I didn't even put it out, he's right, yeah. yeah. if we possibly can and even if we find that our memories are flawed well we say you know just you've got to be scrupulous scrupulously honest as a historian I think that you you know that, that there are flaws in things that you do but it shouldn't stop us from doing it because yeah. we're human beings aren't we yeah. okay some questions yeah yes uh, that's fantastic. first of all I have it's so nice to see you here and I have a your programs so for years here. Thank you. I can, you, can I take you down to the station and you can say it to the boss? The old castle on it. Right. The right side of it. Anyway, I think that I personally feel that this could become too academic. Is that you've got to remember that Liverpool, as a city and a pause, had lots of great music through the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And the summer of love is just a made up thing, really. Is that the, lots of great stuff going on in the city in the late 50s? It was coffee clubs because you didn't have late night clubs. Yes. You had, from the coffee clubs came the likes of uh, the Blue Angel, um, some of these small, tiny, they were just coffee clubs really. And um, the cabin, the cabin was started off as a coffee club. You couldn't have alcohol there. But there were clubs in our city that perhaps some people were, were too young to. to Gone into them that were members clubs to have great music. And Liverpool was always a city that invited great musicians and great talents from all over the world. So, so how would you Frank so, so how day, would you go yeah. about how would you go about researching that then? Because you know your brief seems to be you know, if I've got it right, that you, you, yeah. you're going to do, do some interviews on this summer of love thing. So, so if, if, if that's the case, how would you go about approaching that matter, uh, you know, for the sake of the cathedral then? What, what, how would you go about doing well, your I research? Think that I agree with you that, that, that uh, your research or the people that you speak to should be backed up by pieces of paper, um, i.e. The, the Echo has been mentioned and the Evening Express, all these... I'm, I'm sure that there would have been an awful loss um, about what was happening in the music world. In fact, I think if my memory serves me right, there's a lot full pages in the Liverpool Echo that tell you about gigs that were going on all over the place and fans were coming to town. But if you had, in the 60s, the late 50s and the early 60s, you had the likes of the Cabaret Club. That had, had the great stars of the day, Matt Monroe. Uh, yeah, but, but, yeah, no, but, yeah. the but, what's, but what's that got to do with the project that you're engaged no, in? Now? Well, no, this is what I'm saying is that I think that to talk about the summer of love is that all of a sudden there was this explosion in Liverpool of talent and culture and music is quite wrong. But we're not saying that, no, are we? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I just yeah. wants to make the point is that. Uh, things things about, were very different in 1967 in the rest of the world. Uh, it, it, I think uh, that uh, it, it was already it was already happening. Yes, in the yeah, and there was, there was a ground yeah, spell of opinion. And then it had done as well from right after the end of the war, right through to 1967. Yes. Is that, and there are a lot of people still around uh, that are, are not uh, 
you, you could say that, that, that they might have different memories, but they are their memories. And I'm sure that they're, 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 they're quite clued up to give their views about the summer of love. But, you but it, the, the, the thing we're actually doing is about the cathedral. Yeah, that's right, and but you can't talk to everybody. The, the summer of love is, is involved in the research that we're doing. It, we're, we're doing this, because, or at least I was going to understand, it's the 50th anniversary of the opening of our cathedral. It was being built in, 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 the, in the 60s, and but it was opened in 1967. And I, my personal view about our cathedral is that that's, that, that's synonymous with, with what's been happening in our city for the many years prior to 1967. So I think that, that, that our group here, um, while we're doing our research today, and hopefully right up until May when this thing comes to fruition, the summer of the will be an important part of it. But I think that as far as the research that we're doing, there was a lot of other stuff happening. For instance, somebody said about black groups. There was a big black community. Yeah, but industry. I'm sorry to interrupt though. Hang on a moment though. You, 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 if you're doing some research, you can't do research about everything. No, that's right. So, so what you'd have to do, and I'm not telling you what to do or anything, but what, if you think you're talking in terms of research, as I mentioned before, there are two things that you've got to really think about. First of all, what's practical to research? So somebody must have considered that in relationship to, to 1967, the opening of the Metropolitan Cathedral. So that's one thing that's, you know, maybe the, the, the people here want you to focus on that year because it's an interesting uh, examination. And secondly, as I mentioned before, what you've got to try and do, I think, really, is to, is to as a researcher, you have to clear your mind of what you perceive everything to be and allow the research itself to speak to you and not make your mind up before you even go to talk to people. And I, 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 I think one of the problems in Liverpool, I would have to say, and I've done loads of decades of research in, in Liverpool, is that it's very, very difficult to get people uh, to talk to you if you've already made your mind up about what they're going to say. And I think that, you know, purely from a researcher's point of view, I, I find that that's a crucial aspect. So if you've already made your mind up about everything, why are you bothering researching in the first place? But, but that's, that's your personal view, of course. No, that's a view of it as a historian. Yeah. That's, that's a view no, as a historian. I agree with you. I agree it's not with about, that. I think what you're saying is it's no. not about no. our personal view. No, it's exactly. It's, it's, it's just, just, just about the people who research. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It's not about our personal views, which a lot of people seem to be given. It's about us putting that aside yeah. and being open-minded to ask questions exactly. to get the best out of our yes. experience. Yeah, right. So mm -hmm. maybe we should ask questions now instead of... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And very often, if you're interviewing people for a project, you may have some topics that you want to cover but you've got to listen to what they're saying to you Absolutely. and then ask questions from what you're hearing from them and not missing it. Um, so often you find people, people who, who sort of come into Radio Merseyside or any radio station and, and start to do interviews and things for the first time, they'll write down the questions that they're going to ask someone and you can, you can hear them do it when they ask the questions. Somebody may have already been he may have already answered the next question in his answer, but they'll still go ahead because they've still got that down as a second question. So you, you, when you have a list of questions or a list of topics, you've got to be flexible and yes, listen to what do. the person is saying to you. And they may come out with some extraordinary things yeah. and the interview may go off in, into a different direction. Sometimes anthropologists, uh, and it's a big uh, aspect of popular music studies, you know, rather than oral history on the one hand, there's always this idea of there being a kind of a, an ethnography and uh, anthropologists, I, I worked with a very good one at the university, Sarah Cohen, and, and she finds everything interesting. So she'll allow people to go off on to a tan what appears to be a tangent, because at the, at the end of that, there will be something that will come out of it that's really interesting. And so, whereas an oral historian might not do that, they, they might have a list of things to do. Well, both methods are, are valid. Um, but one fits into a thesis, the oral history, whereas the ethnography doesn't have a thesis really, you just carry on and talk. She even sometimes would observe a group talking amongst themselves yeah. and not even intervene in that. And I always think that's a really interesting method. So just let them talk and if you get their permission you could record it and then pick the bones out of it. And I think that's very interesting as well, you know. Yeah. There's a fascinating comment in the Bruce Springsteen's autobiography 
where he says he goes to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame every year if he's around and sees the people being inducted. And what he's noticed is that when groups go up, there's nearly always someone in the group who is really bitter about things. <laughs> and he uses this as his platform to say what he's wanted to say for 30 years. Yeah. And so people can come out with things that you don't expect at all. Yeah. Anyway, let's say the question, lady in the second row. Um, imagine you're on Desert Island Discs. What would you choose as your one single track from 1967 that sort of epitomises the, the, that time to each of you? I, I would I would suppose a, a wider shade of pale by Procol Harum because I think it's a, it's a wonderful record. I'm going to see Pro, Procol Harum soon, and I think the interesting thing about that about, about a lot of songs, particularly Bob Dylan's Desolation Row, is that the songwriter hasn't said what the song's about. And that's why all these academics are studying these songs, because the songwriters haven't said what it was about. If some Keith Reed, who wrote the lyrics for Whiter Shade of Pale, said, well, this is about so-and-so, <coughs> this is about so-and-so, it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. And so there's this great mystery about the song. And so you could, you could think about it for years, what a 16 Vestal Virgin Virgin's about, why 16? You know, there's all sorts of references and things. And, uh, I mean, the fact that Procol Harum is, is based on uh, Latin, you know, are there, are there perhaps some Latin references in the lyrics? All sorts of things. You could, you could spend a lifetime studying that. Could, yeah. Um, I would, you, you probably never heard of it, in, uh, some of you might have. It's a song called Alone Again or by a group called Love. Yeah. I think not. Yeah. I'll, I'll be you, <laughs> you, you yeah, choose them. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah, Alone Again or by Love. I love California Dreaming by Manus and Bob. Yeah. Um, Second would probably be 23rd Turner, Michelangelo. One of the great, one of the great songs. So you reckon he's very underrated? Very, very underrated, Jimmy Campbell. Yeah. yeah. Talking about that second degree to those people, you know, you were saying it, it was psychedelic and he was doing Michelangelo. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was listening to it, I was only 14 in 1967. I was listening to it and I couldn't see the Sistine Chapel. I was imagining being somebody on drugs and you would see more Picasso mm -hmm. in your head. Well, everybody's got a really interesting way of understanding it, haven't yeah, they? I was know? listening to yeah. it and I couldn't, I was trying to get a picture of Michelangelo and I kept seeing <coughs> Picasso. Yeah. They were yeah. all mixed up. Yeah. It's, it's fast. I mean, you know, that one song, we've, some of you may never have heard of that never song before, or some of you might have heard it a long time, but I didn't hear it at the time, actually. So it just works in a, in a bit of nostalgia in my head for a, a period of time when I was a, when I was a choir boy, actually. But, um, we, you know, we, we, that one song plays, and there's about, I don't know, about 30 people in the room, it immediately becomes 30 songs, because of what's going on in your head. And that's the great thing about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you think we wouldn't have had a lot of this music without the drugs, with the drugs very I think, I think, uh, I mean, I've always been, as I've studied psychedelia quite a lot, and um, from a variety of different perspectives. And um, I would say, I would say psychedelic music on record is not made by people on drugs, because I don't think that music could be made while you were under the influence of it. Of a drug, I think what they, what a lot of the, particularly the English, uh, and I say English, I don't mean British, I mean English musicians uh, do, is they they attempt to give you a musical soundtrack which has been influenced and affected by an acid trip, but to make music while you're on an acid trip is practically impossible in a studio. So 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 you've got a, a piece of recorded sound history there which is very different from reality, haven't you? Recorded sound isn't real, as we said before. Um, so, you know, if you listen to Sgt. Pepper, or if you're listening to uh, Love's album, or Jefferson Airplane, or Early Grey, or whatever it happens to be, that, you know, the, the, the Stone's Satanic Majesties thing, um, I would always argue that what you're not listening to is p are people who are actually on drugs at the time of them making the music. I don't oh, think it would be possible. It's about their experience, yeah. And it's, it's about turning what is actually, a, 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 you know, a mind-expanding uh, experience with colours and shapes and all that, thing, trying to turn it into a musical experience. Which is very similar to some of the classical composers as well, don't forget. You know, a lot of them were opium addicts and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you've got a similar kind of experience there. And, and the, one of the great uh, rock musicians of this period, Frank Zappa, 
made a lot of psychedelic records and he never took any drugs no. at all. No. So, I mean, his mind was made up, yeah. messed up right from the start. Yeah, right from, right from the start. And he, of course, Zappa was really interested in technology, you see, and tape splicing and looping and all of that kind of stuff. So his, his work verges on the, almost on the Yoko Ono side of things as well, didn't the yes. avant-garde as well. Yeah. I mean, the avant-garde in Liverpool was very important, wasn't it, that year? You know, there's yes. lots of avant-garde things going on. The blue coat was like at the centre of a lot of activity. You know, again, if you went back and, and find out, found out what was happening at the blue coat in '67, it was very interesting. But, but Adrian Henry had a few happenings in the way that Yoko yeah. Ono's did, and I went to one of them, and I, I, th I, I think they did it with fun, a sense of humour. Yeah. They knew they were being daft, yeah. and they were asking an audience <laughs> to be daft. Yoko Ono, I don't think, was Does doing it from sense of but it, it, it seemed much more serious that happening <coughs> than she had at the. Uh, at the blue and was that recognisable to you at the time? Was it splendid? Did, did you well, think I, this, I, is a I, bit, this is a bit po faced? I, th stuff? I think it was. Yeah. But yeah. again, you know, it's hindsight. You, yeah. you, 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 you can put yourself back into it, really. Yeah. 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 At the back? I think um, as one of the questions come up is where are we going to have problems here is trying to make those direct links between an event, Summer of Love, and what was happening here at the cathedral itself openings. Yeah. So we have to make sure that we have people coming in who have got the experience, say, of both of them, and give us some succinct sort of answers. We don't want to be asking lots of questions. We want to just try to say, this is it, what have you got? So as Mike was saying, we go through it, take out the best sort of bits of it. So I think if it's, we need help on how we actually control this or better. But you, you've got a list of all the events that mm. took place in the cathedral, haven't you, in 67? Yeah, yeah. So you can, see, you can see the audiences that they were trying to attract. <coughs> mm. I think it's, it is a selective process. I, I mean, it's, it's nothing to... I wouldn't worry about it because you you might find that what you end up doing is you know your context is the cathedral the the primary thing is the cathedral the other stuff is contextual information surrounding it that's all you need to think about so there might be certain little happenings you might I mean if it were me you know and it's not me it's you but if it were me I'd probably do a kind of a timeline of sixty seven and look at what was happening in Liverpool through you know you know copies of the local press that type of thing make a timeline up and see and then talk about it as a Group and see if you thought that any of this was of significance, whether it be summer of love stuff or whatever it happens to be, and then you know bring that into your your contextual arena with the cathedral in the middle of it to say, well, look, this was the year that you know uh, in Liverpool this was happening and this was happening. Also nationally, as we said, the legislation actually is very in interested in 1967 because it shows you that society is changing. I would say. You know, that legislation had taken three, four, maybe even five years to, to reach its fruition, for example, with the Family Planning Act, for example, which would be very relevant to the Catholic Church in many ways, wouldn't it? And the homosexuality. The, hom the, the repeal of the homosexuality. So, so you've got things like that, and I would have thought they'd be quite interesting. But they're national, not just local, of course. You and, know. and there's also the local humour. I mean, was this place known as Paddy's Wigwam as early as 1967? Yeah. 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 When did that come about? Who, yeah. first, who first used that phrase? I mean, I was an Anglican choir boy, and we used to call it the Mersey Funnel. I don't know if you've yeah. have you heard yeah. of that one? Yes. Yeah. 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 So that was, in, you know, I was at St. James's in, in West Derby as a choir boy uh, at that time. Although I wasn't a soprano any longer. But anyway, um, and the, yeah, that was the expression we used. I don't think I'd heard Paddy's wig one thing. Yeah. Mm, it, so just, it, it still makes me cringe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it is insulting, I think. I think so. I think so. But, you know, that, that also features in Liverpool's uh, interest in religious historical past, doesn't it? You know? Yeah. I think the Paddy's Wigwam came about. And I'm sure last week we heard that Roger McGough said it. Yes. I'm sure it's not, I'm sure it's not Roger McGough. I don't think it's an insulting thing, no. honestly. No. No. It's, 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 just, it's, just, it's just a bit of Liverpool. You blame that for people like ourselves and not to raise the money for it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, really. It'd be a good story to follow that, but whether you get an awful lot of. Uh, I don't know. Whether there'll be any results of that yeah. inquiry will be another, another matter. But you don't just have to let that stand, you see. And then anthropologists would go. They, they always do this. Anthropologists go. <laughs> it's all interesting, you see. It's all of interest. And then maybe you then have to sort of select and deselect then. You say, well, look, this is going to be important to us. We think that would work in context, but maybe this is of less significance. And work along those lines, really. It would be, it would be very exciting for you, I think, you know. Yes. 
I wanted to, sorry. No, no, go on. I wanted to ask Mike, you mentioned something, I think, about the Oxford movement. Yeah. About, I, I don't know anything about that. Well, that's going back a while. Does anybody, are you aware of the Oxford movement? You know, the Oxford movement was, was an academic and um, um, kind of group of people that, uh, it's, it's kind of an end of century movement, which starts to create um, um, a levelling of the playing field for Catholicism in Britain. And so, you know, it's a, as a consequence of the Oxford move, movement, really, uh, the Catholic faith receives more recognition as being a legitimate thing. Because, of course, as you can imagine, for, for centuries, really, uh, being a Roman Catholic was a very difficult experience for many people. Well, the Oxford movement contributes to the levelling of the playing field in that respect. Was it and a social movement or a league? Well, not really, no. It's kind of, it's kind of like a, it's, it's, it's a laity and academic thing. So, so there are kind of academic uh, and, uh, and uh, theological reasons why people should accept the Catholic faith again, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and that leads into the 20th century, and it affects a lot of people's uh, ways of understanding Catholicism in the 20th century, which differ a great deal, as you might imagine, from previous years. It brought more respect. Doesn't that. it? Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Absolutely. And at the back? I, I was, I was, I, I'm a teenager at Borsett, but I don't look paper, the Scottish press, so we're doing things. We were doing an article just the other day on about the stadium down at Dixon Street oh, yeah. where the exchange station was. The guy who was giving the talk turned around and said, do you know you're standing on the exact spot where the anti-Catholic riots took out? Uh -huh. And I said, there was, was what? Was two riots went on, they come in and told me to the church down and stuff. So this is like sort of Catholic history we got in the city. This was going back to the Jacobite rebellions mm -hmm. in the 1700s. But there was sort of anti Catholic stuff going on, Absolutely. burning things down. And there's nothing there to say. So there's so much hidden history in this city mm. and the links you can make between Catholicism and how we go from having a hidden church in an attic in a warehouse to suddenly. Just over 120 years later, having a, a trip to the cathedral. Yeah, church. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, whether, again, though, whether you could include all of that in your exhibition or a discussion would yeah. be up to you to decide. And, and what was the Irish Centre doing in 1967? Uh, well, it wasn't the. I don't oh, know whether it was it the Irish. I mean, because it used no. to be the Wellington Rooms, oh, didn't okay. it? It was a dance hall for a, for a long period of time. What, what it was, was it? Youth club as well. Was it a youth club by that stage? Because it went through a variety of incarnations. That building, didn't it? Yeah, but it is all fascinating stuff, and that's why you know it, it's a good thing that you, if you get a discussion group going about this, you know, knock a few ideas around, disagree with each other, because I think you'll formulate some some very significant elements that will give you that context of the year in which the Met opened, and I think that's a key moment because you know one of the things we've got to be careful about as historians is that we don't write out key individuals and we don't write out key times. And there's no doubt in my mind, even though we could stereotype it, there's no doubt in my mind that 67 was an interesting year for a variety of different reasons, not simply musical, but there, there are interests, but it is an interesting year. You've also got key individuals in Liverpool that make this place happen. That's very significant as well. And so if you can just kind of touch on that as an exhibition, I think you'll, really, you'll succeed with that. But talk about it, debate it, argue about it. You know. I also think fashion was um, absolutely. It was very yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean nowadays yeah. something is fashionable in London or Paris, and it's copied, isn't it? It's everywhere. Yeah. But you, you, it, things didn't travel as fast. No, did they, then? no, no. I mean the whole mod subculture down in London was very prominent, really, between about six. Well, it goes back to the late fifties in actual fact, but you know, very prominent in the years 64, 65, 66, really. Um, I remember as a young kid, uh, there being Liverpool mods in 67. I was never one, I must be honest. Um, and of course, they, their younger brothers, you could say, uh, were skinheads, and because they, they gave my subculture a lot of problems in Liverpool. Living in Liverpool was very, very difficult for us. You know, you were beaten up on, I was beaten up several times on Walton Breck Road and County Road, and you'd get chewing gum stuck in your hair when you went to the match, all that sort of stuff. But, but the point I was going to make was that actually I often think that a lot of the London mods would have thought their northern counterparts rather grub, grubby individuals and, and uh, sort of northern versions of... Yeah, very much so, very much so. So that's another good point, isn't it? You know, yeah. gender. But for us, it was all, you know, yeah. big boots and 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah. and the, and the fashion cool. shops that grew up around Liverpool are always interested in the late sixties. I mean, I don't remember um, uh, too much about that, but I remember. I always remember the what you know the tower that was by Lime Street, the, the Punch and Judy Tower, and there was a place there you could get your jeans, and, and then there was Cape on Lime Street. I remember Cape, and you know all of those places stick in people's minds of a certain era. Kensington, yeah, oh yeah, down in yeah, in Camden Town as well, yeah, yeah, looms, yeah, all of that kind of thing is is significant because it's part of a subculture you see as well. Uh, young people trying to be different. I think I think you know, Simon Frith's a very good writer on popular music. He's he's in his seventies now, but I remember him telling. Uh, in a conference it was sometimes. So 67 was a very interesting year. He seemed, he seemed to think it was the year it all came together, he said. Yeah. And then he left it at that. And that's quite interesting if you think of what Spencer was talking about and what Ron had been talking about. Of things kind of happening before and then coming up and drawing together. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the following year we got the riots in Paris, for example. You know, the Renault workers and the students around. Um, things have changed. You know, you've got the Altamont Festival in America where somebody's killed in front of the Rolling Stones. Um, you know. You've also got all the um, Martin Luther King. You have, yeah. People perhaps began to realise that, you know, you yeah. can change things. No, but Bobby Kennedy gets Civil assassinated. Is that 68? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's 63. That's John oh, Kennedy. Bobby, oh, Bobby Kennedy. Oh, yeah. See, this yeah. stuff follows on as well, you see. So, you know, there's, you know, things that are, you, you, you know, you, you probably can't just give somebody a flower, you know. Yeah. Luther King was assassinated in 67. Uh, also 68. 68. 68, yeah. It was a terrible year, you know, for that kind of thing, you know. All right, should we just take another question and then finish? Anyone else? Yeah? Can I try to make a comment as to what you're saying with your records and the Penn Street sort of things we're talking about? I was just walking away from my favourite record of 1967 was dedicated to follow the fashion by the Kings because yes. it seemed to sum up mm -hmm. the ethnicity and it was humorous. I just checked it, it was 1966. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with this yeah. whole idea that you try and put your own memory to fit, yeah. what should you have at the time, yeah. I think is quite... Yeah. Yeah, and the, the Kinks are a very interesting group because at the, at the time they were one of many bands and people yeah. thought they were good and I think time has been very good to them that they're now assessed as being as good as the who and mm. and uh, a lot of the a lot of the other bands also just on that as well it's also worth bearing in mind if we listen to recorded music things that come out in 67 may well have been recorded in 66 yeah. 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 so even if it's got a release date of 67 yeah. they may have recorded it in 66 yeah.